What were you doing 20 years ago in February and March of 2003? Perhaps you were at the movies enjoying part two of the original Lord of the Rings trilogy, or watching the pre-Tom Brady Tampa Bay Buccaneers win Super Bowl 37. Maybe you were listening to 50 Cent's chart topper in the club. But me, I was marching. Not in a band, not in the army, no, of course not. I was marching against an impending war with Iraq. When hundreds of thousands took to the streets of London to protest, I was in that crowd, and demonstrations like it were happening everywhere. Protesters came by the thousands, filling block after block around the United Nations to make a single dramatic statement against going to war. The anti-war protests were on a scale not seen since the Vietnam War. Millions around the globe marched this past weekend. More than a million people jammed into Trafalgar Square to protest U.S. plans for war in Iraq. These were some of the biggest global demonstrations in human history. And in London, we were marching against not just British Prime Minister Tony Blair, who rallied the UK to join the American war effort, but against American President George W. Bush himself. We were right to protest then, and we've been sadly proven right in the 20 years since. 4,000-plus American service members and 400,000-plus Iraqi civilians died as a result of the invasion, an illegal invasion launched by George W. Bush, which is what I want to talk about at length today. In fact, devote the entire show to on this 20th anniversary of the Iraq War, because I, for one, find it bizarre. I'm actually appalled at the way in which almost everyone seems to have moved on from talking about President Bush and his responsibility for one of the great crimes of the 21st century. People in our politics, in our media, in our popular culture haven't just brushed Iraq under the carpet and let Bush off the hook. They've rehabilitated him. They've begun to celebrate him. In the middle of a presidential campaign filled with rancor, we were struck by a very different image over the weekend. First Lady Michelle Obama embracing former President George W. Bush. So good to see the two of them together. I wish yeah. the rest of our politicians could get along as well so as they well. do. What led you to painting? You know, in retrospect, it was... Uh, Longing for learning. That old boy can paint, I can paint. That old boy can paint, I can paint. A former president, now a painter in his prime. Can you enlighten us uh, to the painting? <laughs> George, w. Rem funny. George W. Rembrandt. The portraits that you have done are beautiful. Thank you. You're really talented. I can't believe well, you just started you. five years ago. I painted, uh, these are painted with a lot of passion. You were involved in many notable faux pas, which... Um, <laughs> We, we had a lot of fun with, I'm you sure know, you're opening mission accomplished. the door, there was mission yeah. accomplished. A faux pas. How is any of that okay? Sorry, I don't care how good his portraits are, and I, for one, am not going to laugh and smile about George Bush offering cough drops to Michelle Obama. He can offer up his old medicine cabinet, as far as I care. And I get that the rise of Donald J. Trump has made some Americans look back at George W. Bush and say, maybe he wasn't so bad. I myself wrote a snarky 2015 op-ed about how the anti-Muslim rhetoric of the GOP, of Trump, of Ben Carson, of Mike Huckabee, made me miss George W. And the fact is that the party has certainly gotten more extreme and more bigoted since he left office. But I certainly don't look at Bush and wax nostalgic the way so many Americans and even so many Democrats now seem to. I haven't forgotten about Iraq. And I, for one, certainly didn't need the reminder that SNL's President Bush, a.k.a. Will Ferrell, felt compelled to give during the Trump years. So I just wanted to address my fellow Americans tonight and remind you guys that I was really bad. <laughs> like, like, historically not good. <laughs> Remember, during his last year in office, President Bush's approval rating was in the 20s. But by 2018, in the second year of the Trump presidency, it was up to 61 percent approval. His support among Democrats had quintupled. Nowadays, Americans apparently see W as a cuddly former president with some cute hobbies who wasn't as bad as the Donald. So on today's show, 20 years on, we're marking not just the deaths and destruction inside of Iraq, but the fact that former President Bush somehow just got away with it all. Collective amnesia has always been a problem in American politics, and so two long decades 
has allowed almost everyone to just forget about the long campaign of falsehoods with which Bush kicked off his illegal, brutal, and disastrous Middle East war. Just memory hole it. And yet, before Donald Trump's big lie about the 2020 election, there was George W. Bush's big lie about Iraq's non-existent weapons of mass destruction. Now, we all know Trump has yet to be held to account for his lies, but neither is Bush. And as I'll explain in a moment, George W. Bush was a big reason for why we would later get Donald J. Trump. But first, let me take you back to Wednesday, September the 12th, 2001, the day after the horrific 9-11 attacks. Rescuers at Ground Zero are searching the smoldering rubble for survivors. Families are looking for thousands of missing people. And authorities are matching the names of passengers on those fated jets to the names of suspected al-Qaeda terrorists. So what are President Bush and his closest advisers doing while gathered in the West Wing of the White House? Why, they're talking about bombing Iraq. Yes, Iraq. Something we would only learn later from accounts of insiders like Richard Clark, the U.S. counterterrorism czar under both Bill Clinton and George W. Bush. In fact, when Clark sat with 60 Minutes in 2004 to reveal what had happened, you could really feel the pressure he'd been put under. On September the 12th, 2001, Clark said he had been pulled into a room by President Bush, who asked him if Iraq was to blame. Clark said no, but the president insisted. He came back at me and said, Iraq, Saddam, find out if there's a connection. And in a very intimidating way. It was a current that ran through the White House all of that day, according to Clark. That afternoon, he says, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld was talking about, quote, getting Iraq, even though al-Qaeda was in Afghanistan. Rumsfeld was saying that we needed to bomb Iraq. And, and we all said, but no, no, al-Qaeda is in Afghanistan. We need to bomb Afghanistan. And Rumsfeld said, there aren't any good targets in Afghanistan. And there are lots of good targets in Iraq. Within two months of that meeting, Bush ordered Rumsfeld to draft just such a war plan for Iraq, as Bob Woodward first reported in his book, Plan of Attack. But why? Saddam Hussein, the country's longtime dictator, played no role in the attack on America. In fact, he had been a U.S. ally against Iran in the 1980s. There he was in 1983, shaking hands in Baghdad with a special White House envoy named Donald Rumsfeld. Yes, that Donald Rumsfeld. So what made George W. Bush so determined to attack Iraq two decades later? Was it the push by the so-called neoconservative hawks around him to oust Saddam even before 9-11 and make Iraq a base for pacifying the whole Middle East and protecting Israel? Perhaps it was Iraq's vast oil fields. Even before 9-11, a White House energy task force set up by Vice President and former oil executive Dick Cheney had mapped Iraqi oil reserves and made a list of, quote, foreign suitors for Iraqi oil contracts. And I would note that early in the war itself, officially called Operation Iraqi Freedom, a White House spokesman got the name wrong. He said Operation Iraqi Liberation, or OIL. Whoops. Look, maybe just getting Saddam was personal for Bush, an extension of the first Persian Gulf War and the lingering bad blood between the Iraqi and American ruling families. But there's no doubt his hatred is mainly directed at us. There's no doubt he can't stand us. After all, this is the guy that tried to kill my dad at one time. Whatever his reasoning, George W. Bush was mad, as journalist Robert Draper learned from a religious leader who met with Bush soon after 9-11. Some religious leaders met with him in the Oval Office, and um, the president confessed to them, I'm having difficulty containing my bloodlust. Bush seemed increasingly fixated on Saddam Hussein. In March 2002, just six months after 9-11, as National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice met with three senators in her office, Time magazine reported, according to one participant, that Bush poked his head into Rice's office and announced to them all, quote, F Saddam, we're taking him out. Those words from President Bush were first reported in 2003 and haven't been publicly disputed since. Now, the best check against the march to war might have been a press that asked tough questions that acted as a true watchdog. But few in the American mainstream media challenged the evidence-free claims over WMDs at that time, or acknowledged the deep cynicism and dishonesty of the man pushing them the hardest. The man who would talk about terrorism and violence in the Middle East like this. We must stop the terror. 
I call upon all nations to do everything they can to stop these terrorist killers. Thank, Thank you. you. Now watch this drive. Sure, the Gettysburg Address is great, but is there anything more American than George W. Bush cheerleading a war on terror from the first green at the Cape Arundel Golf Club? He had his war plans for Iraq. He had a complacent press. All that was missing was a pretext to invade. Four words. Weapons of mass destruction. A massive stockpile of biological weapons. Anthrax and botulism toxin and possibly small pox. Biological weapons factories on wheels and on rails. VX and sarin and mustard gas. Attempts to acquire high specification aluminum tubes. High quality aluminum tubes. High strength aluminum tubes suitable for nuclear weapons production. Nuclear weapons. We know he's out trying once again to produce nuclear weapons. We have solid evidence of the presence in Iraq of Al-Qaeda members. Various terrorist groups, including the Al-Qaeda organization. Al-Qaeda leaders have sought contacts in Iraq who could help them acquire uh, weapon of, weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. We don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. Facing clear evidence of peril, we cannot wait for the final proof. Guess what? There were no WMDs. We know that now, but the key fact here is that they should have known that then. They had almost no intel to suggest Saddam had actual WMDs, certainly not a massive stockpile, to quote Bush, or that Saddam played any role in 9-11 or had any working relationship with al-Qaeda. These were just wishes masquerading as evidence. And the most egregious example was the claim that Saddam was developing nuclear weapons. Take a moment and just listen to 16 crucial words that help get the American public on board with going to war, the line that scared the bejesus out of them. The British government has learned that Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. President Bush in his 2003 State of the Union. Those 16 words, reported on and repeated uncritically by much of our media at the time, played a massive role in convincing people in America and abroad that Saddam posed a nuclear threat to all of us. It was one thing if Iraq had biological or chemical weapons, but the idea of the regime with a nuclear weapon, perhaps sharing it with terrorists, was a whole other level of immediate danger. And Bush claimed there were receipts. Thing is, those receipts did not stand up to even the lightest scrutiny. In 2001, the U.S. received intelligence from Italy's government suggesting that Saddam Hussein had tried in the 1990s to buy yellow cake uranium powder from Niger. Yellow cake is used for nuclear energy production, but also for nuclear weapons. This intel was flimsy, to say the least. It wasn't corroborated. And the idea that Iraq would buy 500 tons of this uranium without the ability to process it was pretty absurd. But nonetheless, the White House wanted any information to prove that Iraq had looked to buy yellow cake uranium. So just months after 9-11, the CIA sent someone to Niger to check it out. They sent the former U.S. ambassador to that country, Joseph Wilson. He had plenty of contacts and would surely be able to see if there was any trace of such a sale. When Wilson got back to the U.S., he told the CIA he could find no evidence that Iraq had tried to buy yellow cake uranium powder. And the CIA warned the White House, don't say that they did in Bush's speech. The U.S. intelligence didn't support it. So what then do you do if you're the Bush White House and your intel services won't confirm the story you want to tell? Well, the Bush White House found a workaround. Let's play those 16 words again, but this time pay close attention to the source of that intelligence on Iraq and uranium. The British government has learned that Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. The British government has learned. Yeah. Bush cited another country's unproven intelligence and acted like U.S. intelligence experts hadn't already debunked it. You can imagine Joe Wilson's surprise when he heard that speech in January 2003, almost a year after his trip to Niger. You actually don't have to imagine. Wilson wrote a New York Times op-ed shortly after the Iraq invasion. Quote, if my information was deemed inaccurate, I understand though I would be very interested to know why. If, however, the information was ignored because it did not fit certain preconceptions, about Iraq, then a legitimate argument can be made that we went to war under false pretenses. But it wasn't just Wilson's revelations that shook the public. Bush's case for war had already begun to crumble even before the first bomb dropped. 
In early March 2003, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency told the United Nations that the documents which appeared to show Niger's government selling uranium to Iraq were actually forgeries. Over the next year, the Bush administration's claims about nuclear weapons, aluminum tubes, chemical weapons, mobile biolabs, all fell apart. The sourcing was a joke. The CIA wasn't on board. Meanwhile, remember, there's an insurgency in Iraq, the body count is mounting, the WMDs aren't there, and this is how the then-president responds to it all, just one year after the invasion, at a gala with D.C. journalists. This is an actual gag that the Bush White House came up with at the time. I kid you not. I'm gonna do one of my slideshows. <laughs> These are actual unstaged photos pulled from the files of the White House photo office. Those weapons of mass destruction gotta be somewhere. <laughs> Nothing but laughs and jokes. So when people say, oh, look at Michelle and W and their friendship, their sharing of cough drops, I think of that clip of Bush that we just played, having lied about WMDs, having got American soldiers killed, already thousands of Iraqis killed at that point, and laughing about it, mocking the whole thing, not giving a damn. But hey, all is forgotten, all is forgiven, even this. Saddam Hussein and his sons must leave Iraq within 48 hours. Their refusal to do so will result in military conflict commenced at a time of our choosing. For George W. Bush, the war was a story he thought he could spin, a story with a definite beginning and a definite end. He chose the beginning. With a shock and awe spectacle on March the 20th, 2003, that captivated the media. And he even tried to choose when it would end, just 43 days later, with him in a flight suit swaggering onto the deck of an aircraft carrier, framed by cheering troops, and a banner reading, Mission Accomplished. But Bush knew it wasn't over. The U.S. occupation had another 103 months to go, and the U.S.-inflicted atrocities were just beginning. The torture and sexual abuse of detainees at Abu Ghraib prison the use of white phosphorus to firebomb Fallujah, a major Iraqi city with a quarter million residents. And, of course, the massacres of ordinary Iraqis, ordinary civilians at Haditha and Mahmoudiyya and Hamdaniya. And in many of those atrocities, the U.S. military's initial accounts, their initial denials, turned out to be flat false. Like when a U.S. gunship killed at least 40 Iraqis, including dozens of women and children, at a wedding party near the Syrian border. Top coalition military officials are not disputing the number of dead, but are suggesting these pictures may have been staged and don't match the facts on the ground. Senior Pentagon officials tell NBC News that a Spectre gunship like this one did launch an attack today, not on a wedding party, but on insurgents. And we are satisfied at this point that the intelligence that led us there uh, was validated by what we found on the ground. And it was not that there was a wedding party going on. Even after video evidence and eyewitness testimony basically destroyed the entire U.S. military narrative, the Pentagon refused to apologize. So just what are the effects on a country of invasion and occupation by an unapologetic, heavily armed, high-tech foreign army? You may have been told of the costs here at home in blood and treasure. 4,418 American service members dead and nearly 32,000 wounded, according to the Pentagon. Our coffers depleted by around two to three trillion dollars. Our entire politics upended, our faith in our media forever shaken. But what of the cost to Iraqis? Between 275,000 and 306,000 civilians died from direct war-related violence caused by the U.S., its allies, the Iraqi military and police, according to Brown University's Costs of War project. As many as a third of a million people. But they add, several times as many Iraqi civilians may have died as an indirect result of the war due to damage to the systems that provide food, health care and clean drinking water, and as a result, illness, infectious diseases and malnutrition that could otherwise have been avoided or treated. Shockingly, according to reporting by Al Jazeera based on Iraqi government data, childhood cancers increased 12-fold, 
in the six years after the U.S. assault on Fallujah, which involved the use of white phosphorus and depleted uranium weapons. And 15 percent of all babies there had birth defects, a rate many times worse than in the aftermath of the nuclear bombs dropped by the U.S. on Japan during World War II. And what do Iraqis have to show for this war and occupation of ours? Yes, Saddam Hussein is gone, a good thing. But the country remains plagued by violence, corruption, and a lack of proper democracy. Remember, this wasn't just a tragic accident. It was a crime, an illegal war built on blatant lies and waged so brutally by George W. Bush, the commander-in-chief. A war which caused chaos in the region and in the wider world. A war whose perpetrators have never faced any consequences. And again, one man in particular. It's time for us to be honest. As the president, as the commander in chief, George W. Bush was responsible for war crimes on multiple fronts. As former Nixon lawyer John Dean, who you often hear on cable news these days, slamming Trump, as he wrote just three months after the Iraq invasion, this is the first potential scandal I have seen that could make Watergate pale by comparison. Manipulation or deliberate misuse of national security intelligence data, if proven, could be a high crime. Under the Constitution's impeachment clause, it would also be a violation of federal criminal law. And that's just domestic high crimes and misdemeanors. The Bush administration misled the world, and when the United Nations refused to back Bush's unprovoked war of aggression, he launched it anyway. Back in 2004, the leader of the United Nations at the time, the then Secretary General Kofi Annan, left no doubt as to what that meant. Now the UN Secretary General has made his strongest statement yet, denouncing the war. It's not in conformity with the UN Charter from our point of view and from the Charter point of view. It was illegal. He wasn't alone. An independent inquiry by the Dutch government in 2010 also concluded that the invasion was an illegal violation of UN Security Council resolutions, the UN Charter led by the US. And that's just a decision to go to war. Prominent human rights groups have said Bush and his allies should have been held to account for all of the torture and alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity that occurred inside of Iraq on his watch at the hands of forces he commanded. And two such groups in New York and Geneva filed criminal complaints against Bush in 2011 for violating the International Convention on Torture, a move so serious that Bush cancelled a speech he'd had planned in Switzerland. His team cited security concerns, but one lawyer for Human Rights Watch speculated to a reporter, quote, he's avoiding the handcuffs. Of course, American presidents have never been put in handcuffs. Right now, in 2023, millions of Americans, for example, are waiting to see if former President Donald J. Trump will be put in handcuffs, if he will be indicted for multiple alleged crimes in multiple American jurisdictions. Coup plots, hush money payments, classified documents, not to mention the civil lawsuits he faces. So much of our discourse today and so much of our country's future is bound up in these questions of whether Trump is going to be prosecuted, whether a former president for the first time could see the inside of a prison if he's found guilty of committing real crimes, whether he could be held accountable. Meanwhile, George W. Bush is chilling in retirement, painting up a storm. Why aren't we having that debate about him as well? If we can talk about criminal culpability in relation to Trump, why can't we talk about it in relation to Bush? Why the double standard? I mean, not even the worst of Trump's alleged crimes, the incitement of an armed insurrection at the Capitol, come anywhere close to the death and destruction that George W. Bush brought to Iraq. And I should also point out, many would argue there's a pretty straight line between the imperial presidency of Bush and the faux populist autocracy of Trump. Where else did Trump get the idea that a disengaged tycoon trading on a family name brand could attain the highest office in the country, that he could cover his bumbling mistakes and ignorance with swagger and spin an alternate reality based on fear and loathing. Remember, Donald Trump was also able to batter the Bush family, both George and his brother Jeb, who was running for president against Trump in 2016, by invoking the catastrophe in Iraq, a war-weary GOP base responded positively. Obviously, the war in Iraq was a big, fat mistake, all right? George Bush made a mistake. We so, can make mistakes, but that one was a beauty. We should have never been in Iraq. We have destabilized right. the Middle East.
Iraq and Bush helped pave the way for 2016 and the rise of Trump. Iraq and Bush also helped pave the way for 2020 and the big election lie. Don't take my word for it. Listen to author Robert Draper, who's written two books on Bush and one on the Trump GOP. What's the legacy of the war in Iraq for the U.S., for America's foreign policy? Yeah, well, so I, in a way, Steve, I think that the legacy is what we heard um, before I got on the air uh, with people talking about, uh, you know, with their conspiracy theories relating to mail-in balloting, that, that there has been a sort of war on truth that uh, was made possible by the recognition that um, the U.S. government was not on the level with us um, after Iraq. And, and it became possible then for a reality TV show star with zero political experience to say during the Republican primaries, look at all you guys with all of your experience. What experience did that get us? In the 20 years since the United States invaded a country that had not attacked us to install a government that wasn't representative on the basis of a threat that did not exist, there's been no real introspection, reflection, or reckoning with how that disaster came about and how to hold the architects of that disaster to account. Even as one subsequent American leader threw all of Bush's time-tested media manipulation tactics, and then some, into assaulting, literally and figuratively, the very foundation of our democracy. And as another world leader on the other side of the globe actively used our own illegal invasion of Iraq to justify his own illegal invasion of Ukraine, yet another geopolitical disaster and humanitarian crisis built on brazen lies and a total disregard for international law. Thanks to George W. Bush and thanks to our tolerance of, our indulgence of George W. Bush, America has no real standing or credibility when it comes to calling out the crimes of Vladimir Putin in Ukraine today. And yet, in the words of George W. Bush today, Ukraine, like Iraq, has just become another laugh line. The result is an absence of checks and balances in Russia and the decision of one man to launch a wholly unjustified and brutal invasion of Iraq. I mean, of Ukraine. <laughs> Iraq, too. Anyway. Uh... <laughs> Iraq, too. Of course, he doesn't really mean it. That wasn't a Freudian slip. Even now, Bush doesn't actually believe there was anything wrong with his invasion of Iraq. The former president has had multiple opportunities over two decades to show regret remorse, contrition for what he did, but he refuses to. Knowing what you know now about Iraq, do you still think it was a good idea to go absolutely. in? Absolutely. You still do? Oh, absolutely. I really do. I'm absolutely confident that, uh, that getting rid of Saddam Hussein made our country safer and gave people a chance of Iraq, of living in a free society. George W. Bush is not a kind, sweet man, to quote Michelle Obama. He's not a really lovely man, to quote Nancy Pelosi. He's not someone you brag about your friendship with, as Ellen DeGeneres and Bill Clinton have done. On this 20th anniversary of his greatest crime, let us remember George W. Bush not hagiographically as the artist with paint on his hands, but more honestly, more bluntly, as the invader with blood on his hands.